It's the craze sweeping through America. They need daddy, the state, to do things for them. But how has socialism fared in the rest of the world? If you want prosperity, capitalism is what produces it. And then... I knew I was in trouble. A freak accident. How am I going to get out of here? Leaves a farmer fighting for his life. Lord, either get me back on that tractor or I'm ready to come home to you. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, whoever's in charge of the Republican Party should be drawn and quartered for allowing that bloodletting to go on week after week after week as candidates cut each other up and, and uh, try to eviscerate each other going into the general election. The whole thing is insane. And it should have been stopped months ago, but it continued yesterday, last night. Uh, did you watch that mess? You know, I watched for a little while. Yeah. I just don't have the stomach for it anymore. You know, it's it's the same old, same old. Slam well, you this, know, slam Mitt that. Mitt Romney it. comes out. He ran a terrible campaign. He comes out against Trump, and and he says things about him, some of which are true, some are not true. And uh, why? What is he trying to accomplish? You know, if this guy is the front runner, he's bringing hundreds of thousands of new people into the party. If he's uh, the titular head of the party and he's going to be the nominee of the party, then the people don't do themselves any favors by weakening him prior to the general election. The whole thing is insane. And this is a great country, and it just makes you sick at your stomach to see it. I was engaged in this kind of thing back in the days when Reagan ruled, and the rule was the 11th commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of a fellow Republican. But they sure have broken that commandment in spades. Mm -hmm. They didn't adhere to the rule last no night. No way. <laughs> well, the Republican presidential race has already been a heated affair, as we said, but last night it, it went to a whole new level of nastiness. Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and Marco Rubio went after each other with political and personal insults. The candidates did talk about some issues like the economy and immigration. David Brody was there to sort it all out. This debate can be summed up in one word, ugly. Little Marco. Actually, make that two, downright ugly. Breathe, Lion breathe, Ted. breathe. The only person missing was Jerry Springer. Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz took turns laying into frontrunner Donald Trump. Of all the people on the stage, he performs the worst against Hillary Clinton. Wrong. I beat Hillary Clinton. I beat Hillary Clinton, points, I beat Hillary Clinton in many polls. I beat Hillary Clinton in many polls. If you're our nominee, excuse me, excuse me. I think I'm talking. Hold on. Oh, excuse me. I beat Hillary Clinton in many polls. Hold on, hold on. John Kasich had enough. I have never tried to go and get into these kind of scrums that we're seeing here on the stage. Stage and people say everywhere I go, you seem to be the adult on the stage. But the mudslinging continued, this time okay. with a tussle over Trump University in which some students are suing for fraud. This is a case I could have settled very easily, but I don't settle cases very easily when I'm right. He's trying to con people into giving them their vote, just like he conned these people into giving them their money. Me, the real con artist is Senator Marco Rubio. Now the people of Florida can't stand him. He couldn't get elected dog catcher. We're going to spend the spring, the fall, and, and, and the summer with the Republican nominee facing a fraud trial. Oh, stop with it. Hillary it's Clinton a minor saying, case. It's, it's a minor civil two. case. Donald, learn not to interrupt. There are many, many civil cases. Count to yeah, 10, right. Donald. Count to 10. No topic was off limits. Rubio went after Trump on making his clothing line overseas. He can start tonight by announcing that all the Donald J. Trump clothing will no longer be made in China and in Mexico, but will be made here in the United States. This little guy has lied so so much we go. about my record. Here we go. You asked him about the economy, and the first thing he does is launch an attack about some little guy thing. Because he doesn't have answers. No, and he's no, asking us to answer. make him the president of the United Believe States me. of America. Believe me. I know this is not a game. I know what's anymore. happening with the economy. You don't know it. Well, thing. then answer the you, economy. You haven't question. employed in your life one but person. Does. Don't worry about it, little Marco. And then uh, came discussion about an off the record, record conversation times, that Trump had with the New York Times. There's an audio recording apparently suggesting that Trump isn't as hard line on his immigration views as he leads on. How flexible are you on this issue? 
Not very flexible. But there's always give and take. There's always negotiation. Will you release the tape? No, authorize I the never do that. I, don't, I would not do that. But if, in fact, you went to Manhattan and said, I'm lying to the American people, then the voters have a right to know. No, no, no you're the liar. You're lying the lying to guy up here. You're the, Why you're don't the you one. Release the you're tape the one. Then. Release the you're tape. You're the one. Now, let me Why just you, tell you. Let me you just say, excuse tape? me. I've given my answer, Lion Ted. Even the Fox News moderators got into the act by playing a video showing what they say are true. Trump's inconsistent views on issues like the Iraq war, Syrian refugees as well. You have to show a degree of flexibility. If you're going to be one way and you think it's wrong, does that mean the rest of your life you have to go in the wrong direction because you don't want to change? Trump's flexibility comments led to this testy exchange over Supreme Court nominees. Trump says Cruz supported John Roberts, who ended up siding with the Obama administration on Obamacare. I wrote one op-ed supporting President Bush's nomination after he made it. I would not have made that nomination. But let me point out, not what Donald you say in the actually cared That is about, not what you it, said in the op-ed. Donald, op please, I know it's hard yeah, not to interrupt. Is, but, but it's but not try. what you said in the op-ed. Breathe. breathe Lion Ted. Breathe. Lion you can do it. You can breathe. I, I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but just. When they're done with the yoga, can I answer a question? You, you cannot. <laughs> I really hope that we don't, we don't see yoga on this stage. Well, he's very flexible, so we, you never know. Despite the fighting, each candidate answered the question about supporting the eventual Republican nominee, even if it was Trump. Yes or no? I'll support Donald if he's a Republican nominee. Yes, because I gave my word that I would. Can you definitively say tonight that you will definitely support the Republican nominee for president even if it's not you. But the answer is, yes, I will. The Republican candidates will be back on the debate stage next week down in Florida. That is Marco Rubio's home state. The debate is March 15th. It's a winner-take-all primary. And if Donald Trump can win there, then it will be the clearest indication yet that he will be the Republican nominee for president. David Brody, CBN News, in Detroit, Michigan. Thanks, David. I am appalled. I am simply appalled that they would allow this to happen. The ones, I mean, Ryan Priebus, who's head of their party now, he should have stopped this thing a long time ago. This is ridiculous. And it's giving fodder to whoever the Democratic nominee, uh, nominee is. You can see these statements coming up in, in uh, TV commercials over and over and over again. It is insanity to allow something like that to happen. And this isn't a discussion of I issues. It isn't uh, adult uh, discourse about major problems facing the world. This is petty nonsense. It wouldn't even go well in a fraternity in college. I just can't believe it that we allow this to happen, and yet it's happened, and they're going to do another one. It, I mean, the powers that be in the Republican Party say, no way, no more, no how. Stop it. You know, Hillary Clinton might well be indicted uh, for her uh, email scandals. There's some pretty horrible things going on. and so. The, the leader of the Democratic Party might wind up being indicted in the summer, and the Republican candidate would be weakened by all of the bloodletting that's going on now. Going to the election, who would we choose? Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. How can we allow it to, to become what it has become over the last few months? It is just disgraceful. Well. Whoever the next president is, he or she will face some deadly foreign policy challenges, including a possible nuclear threat from North Korea. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Here's Ephraim. Pat, North Korea's leader has ordered its military on standby to launch nuclear strikes at any time. A North Korean news agency confirmed the test fire of a new multiple launch rocket system. The move is in response to the recent harsh U.N. sanctions over the country's recent nuclear test and long-range rocket launch. Charlene Aaron has this story. These photos show North Korean leader Kim Jong-un observing the test firing of six projectiles off the east coast of the Korean Peninsula Thursday. 
North Korean state media reports that Un wants the country's nuclear weapons to be ready for use at any time and that the country will ready its military so it is prepared to carry out preemptive attacks. The test firings come in the face of what North Korea sees as an effort by its enemies, South Korea and the U.S., to overthrow its leaders. It follows harsh U.N. sanctions over the North's recent nuclear test and long-range rocket launch. It also comes ahead of joint U.S.-South Korean war games this month that the North claims are invasion preparations. The U.N. sanctions include mandatory inspections of cargo leaving and entering North Korea by land, sea or air, and a ban on all sales or transfers of small arms and light weapons. The Pentagon is urging North Korea to refrain from provocative actions that aggravate tensions. The U.S. and South Korea have begun talks on the possible deployment of a U.S. missile defense shield in the South. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Strong leadership needed to respond. Pat? Well, uh, you know, uh, Peter King said it's, it's a uh, crime family posing as a nation, and that's exactly what it is. But nevertheless, they are paranoid. They, they are isolated, and uh, they're filled with propaganda. And it is disgusting to see what they are doing. But nevertheless, they're spending at least a third of their GDP or more on arms and they have enough arms to distribute and sell them to other countries. So they have advanced uh, missile technology. They're working, they claim they have thermonuclear weapons, and they probably do. And um, they have a, a tremendous uh, arsenal of, of weapons and uh, troops. They threaten South Korea, but nevertheless, something should be done. I don't know what the answer is, but something has to be done. And one of the people have said, well, they ought to, we ought to lean on China, but I don't know, China's probably very happy to have them down there giving us trouble. But nevertheless, the, to have a rogue state like that running around the world, it's, it's very, very disturbing and very dangerous. Efren? Pat, a disturbing new video released by the Islamic State appears to show the group raising up a new generation of terrorists. The video, reported by the London Daily Mail, starts off showing the orphaned children of jihadi parents who've been killed, playing with toys and being given food. The children seem to be having a good time like typical children, but then the video shifts to a military perspective, as it shows young boys in military outfits training and learning how to fight as the next generation of ISIS warriors. You can get a link to the story and see more of this video by going to our website. It's cbnnews.com. Pat. Well, Terry has the next story, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue today. We're not trying to frighten you, but it just gives you a real cause to do some praying because we need to pray and ask God's intervention. Terry. Well, from a political perspective, while many young Americans are feeling the burn, the people who live under socialism are issuing a dire warning. Be careful what you wish for. It's terrible. We're not able to be uh, grown-ups, in a way. When you have those people demonstrating in the streets, again, they're just asking for Santa Claus. So what's the real solution? You'll find out. That's next. Well, you're watching the 700 Club. We're delighted to have you with us on this Friday. God bless every one of you. Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders has been campaigning on a promise that, get this, socialism is the answer for the problems with the American economy. He's even attracted a powerful audience of young people. <clears throat> but as Dale Hurd reports, they don't have a clue about what life under socialism actually is. Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders thinks what America needs is socialism. Health care should be a right of all people, the right to go to a public college or university tuition free. At least three months of paid family and medical leave. The 74-year-old senator has become a rock star to many millennials who believe in his message and like all the free stuff he's offering. 
They say he is saying all the things that I need and I want. I want health care. I want an education. I don't want to have to be paying back my student loans for years and years and years. I have a lot of student debt. I think that he's going to do great things for education. Gender equality and equal pay and equality for everyone. Sanders is careful to call his program democratic socialism and doesn't mention Cuba or North Korea, where the average person makes less than $2,000 per year, or Venezuela, where socialism has resulted in food shortages, or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, where a young Sanders went on his honeymoon. He talks instead about European social democracies. It's true that Europe has a long history with socialism, and some of it isn't pretty. France is the land where some joke that communism succeeded. The French have the kind of welfare state Sanders wants, and from which the French government is trying to escape. France is trapped. Having built a welfare state it can no longer afford, it keeps raising taxes, killing the businesses that it needs to fund its welfare state. While Bernie Sanders has said he would like Americans to work less, France's socialist president, Francois Hollande, is trying to get the French to work more by ending the 35-hour work week. But the French don't take kindly to having their welfare yanked by the government. They tend to protest and sometimes set things on fire. French free market economist Emmanuel Martin says socialism has also weakened the French work ethic and entrepreneurial spirit making people psychologically dependent on the state. Individuals cannot be responsible. They need daddy, the state, to do things for them. It's terrible because we are, we're not able to be uh, grown-ups in a way. We're not grown-ups. We just, when you have those people uh, uh, demonstrating in the streets, again, they're just asking for Santa Claus. While polls show most Democrats in the U.S. now believe socialism has a positive impact on society, Half of French young adults say they would flee France if they could because the future looks so bleak. The entrepreneurial uh, young people of France, they are heading elsewhere. They're going to London, they're going uh, to Asia, they're going to the United States. American millennials are understandably concerned about their futures. They've entered the workforce during one of the weakest economic periods in decades. Cato Institute fellow Michael Tanner. Well, look, if you're young and your student debts are piling up and you don't know whether there's going to be a job when you get out of school, the prospect of somebody telling you he'll give you something, uh, that sounds pretty good. They've seen capitalism bashed in school and in the media as the problem and not the solution. But the fact is that if you want economic growth, if you want those jobs, if you want prosperity, capitalism is what produces it. Statistics show that the freest economies are the most competitive. Sanders thinks America should follow Scandinavia. And I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden and Norway and learn from what they have accomplished for their working people. But what Scandinavia is Sanders talking about? Sweden, Denmark and Norway all have lower business taxes than the United States, which has the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world. Sweden has cut taxes in partially privatized health care and social security. Denmark has cut back too. I, I think he's basically wrong about what they are. Those are not really socialist economies. What they are is capitalist economies, in some cases more fiercely competitive than our own, uh, with social programs sort of layered on top of them. One study showed Sanders' socialism could cost the U.S. $18 trillion. But I do believe that the middle class and the working families of this country, their incomes should go up not down. And the data shows that the best chance for that to happen is with capitalism. It's what some French wish they had more of. Dale Hurt, CBN News, Paris. Thanks, Dale. I think without question, free market capitalism is the best way to uh, bring a successful uh, economy along. Socialism does not work. Margaret Thatcher says socialism has worked and until there's nobody you can take money away from. And uh, it's the idea <clears throat> it, it, uh, of, of this uh, income equality. It does not work. The thing about Sanders is you have to remember, he was a bum. I mean, like a bum.
who had no money. He did not have a first paycheck until he was almost 40 years old. He never had a job. And when he finally got a job, his first job was counting up the people who were on food stamps. That is where he, his business experience was until he was 40 years old. Terry? Well, you know, in some of those men on the street polls, a lot of the young people that were asked what socialism mm. is were clueless. I mean, they had no idea what he was oh, even no, telling. Oh, no, it's, it's you going to give me something good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want the goodies. Sure, yeah. I want to get the good. Oh, man. Oh, dear. You just wonder. I mean, dear Lord, if, if we have uh, hatched a generation of people in our schools who have no critical uh, way of analyzing what's going on in the world, do not understand the trends, and you see this horrible debate, what a horrible debate. No issues really being brought up. I mean, it was just ridiculous. No wonder young people get turned off by that stuff. And uh, somebody comes along the Pied Piper, says, I'm going to give you goodies. I'm going to give you free medicine. I'm going to give you free education. I'm going to give you uh, a $15 an hour wage when you come out as a starter flipping burgers. I want to just take care of you. Don't you worry about a thing. That has great appeal to a generation that has no critical ability to analyze what's going on. Oh, man. Pray for this nation, folks. Terry? Well, coming up, farming is a back-breaking labor. And for one Michigan rancher, it broke more than that. I was scalped to the head. I had four fractured ribs, four fractured vertebrae. My spleen was split. My femur broke. Watch the miracle that helped save his life when we return. You are watching the 700 Club, and today, Lord willing, is Friday. This is the end of a very amazing week that's going on in our society, and uh, uh, we're telling you more about what's happening. I want to introduce to you a guy named Timothy Vanderswag. Time was running out for him. The cattle farmer had spent his day working in the fields until a freak accident left him cold, bleeding, and broken, and minutes away from death. The pain is something I just can't explain, but also just the fight to get back to get home. I want to go see my wife. I want to be with my kids. That's a fight you just don't realize how deep it is until it is brought out of you. Tim and Teresa Vanderswag love life on their family farm near Holland, Michigan. But they know with the beauty of farm life often comes dangerous work. You always hear stories of um, a tragedy when a tractor will roll over it um, in the middle of a night when a farmer's in the middle of a field and he doesn't come home. To get that phone call or to hear that news about your husband um, is something I've n never wanted. On a bitter cold night in December 2013, Tim was working alone in a field. As he stepped to the back of the tractor, he tripped and fell near the PTO shaft, which connects the tractor to the manure spreader. The shaft spins at over 500 rotations per minute. So I could feel the thing starting to wind up on my left side of my pants, and um, I knew I was in trouble. I reached out to grab whatever I could hold on to. And with seconds, I was just being wound up and beaten up against the frame of the manure spreader and then thrown off to the opposite side, just literally naked with all the clothes stripped right off my body. Tim lay on the freezing ground, trying to grasp the situation. How did this happen? What did I just go through? How am I gonna get out of here? And, and just instantly, okay, let's start to crawl. I'll, I'll, I'll crawl to the tractor. Well, yeah, I, I was scalped to the head. I had four fractured ribs, four fractured vertebrae. My spleen was split. My hip was displaced, my femur broke, my ankle was crushed. I can remember looking down and seeing my leg laying across my lap and just this huge bulge in my side. He tried crawling toward the tractor. And I was done. I, I had burned up all my energy and I remember just saying a very simple prayer and it was, Lord, either get me back on that tractor or I'm ready to come home to you. Within seconds, 
I had a calmness and a clarity that I did not have before. I, I just felt peace. And the first thing God was saying to me is get crawled to the tractor. If I knew I could get somewhere, I could get help. He knew he didn't have much time left. It's 10 degrees, it's getting dark. My body's starting to shut down at this point. I truly believe angels were there with me and God wasn't done with me yet and he helped me get back onto the tractor seat. And I can remember the feeling once I got up onto the tractor seat of, thank you God, I'm on the tractor. Now I have to push in the clutch with my foot that's dangling across my lap. Thankfully, he was able to get the tractor in gear and moving. Though his body was shutting down, his heart and mind were focused in prayer and thankfulness he was still alive. I remember just curling through the field and just thinking, thank you, God. I cannot believe you've gotten me this far, but I need your help. I need someone to help me because I don't have much time left. Lord, just take care of me. Get me through this. I love you and you've always been here with me, but I need you now more than I've ever needed before. He drove his tractor onto a nearby road and blocked traffic. The first driver there was an off-duty firefighter. Within minutes, Tim's wife got the phone call she had feared for so long. He introduced himself as a deputy, and I could hear Tim screaming in the, in the background, and I knew it was that phone call. And I get a piece that passes understanding, and I just knew that the Lord was holding me. When Teresa got to the scene, Tim was surrounded with neighbors and family praying and helping emergency personnel. It was so out of control and so much chaos. You had no choice but to rely on the Lord just to, and I literally did fall to my knees and start praying. There's nothing more that I could do for him. I remember looking off the tractor down and hearing her, I'm here, honey, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. And it was almost like a confirmation of, we have you. And, I, and you really needed it, because at that point, my body was starting to shut down to the point I was starting to die. They figured he had about 10 minutes to live based on hypothermia and blood loss. Even though his situation was dire, they felt God was supplying all their needs. The prayers were immediate, and I could just, I was covered with peace. I mean, incredibly covered with peace one thing after another of the right people there at the right time. That is all God's hand in this. Tim was rushed to the hospital where doctors were able to save his leg and stabilize his condition. It wasn't luck that a doctor was able to fix me. Yes, God worked through that person to fix my body, but it's only by the grace of God that I'm sitting here today. Tim and Teresa know it was the power of prayer and their Christian community standing with them that brought them through this desperate time. I was one of the strongest guys out there and I could do about anything I wanted to. Within seconds, I was reduced down to who's gonna feed me, who's gonna give me my med You cannot do it alone. And don't you want that community in Christ to come around you and just wrap their arms around you and your family and say, don't worry about it, we're gonna take care of it. God gives us everything we need to now when he's walking and farming and working and being dad and husband again, it's, it's a lot to be thankful for. And we just believe that he is alive for reasons and that we need to just give God the honor and glory. I, I don't know why I went through this. I know I did and, and I'm not gonna let this affect me for the rest of my life and change me in a bad way. I, I, I hope to say it's changed me in a lot of ways in a good way. It's made me come to appreciate what a great God we have even more. Sometimes people wonder, if I pray, has God even hear me? I was laying naked in a, in a cornfield, beaten almost to death. God was right there. He listens. He's not going to sometimes answer you the way you want, but He is there for you all the time. Man, what a shout of triumph. He's there with you all the time. We want to pray for you right now, and we have some uh, requests and some testimonies. Steve, who lives in Dawes, West Virginia, developed a severe pain in his lower back after a week of staying home, taking pain medication, several sleepless nights. He was miserable. He was on the verge of having someone take him to the hospital. 
when he heard a small voice tell him, turn on television. And lo and behold, he watched. Terry, you gave this word, God is healing back pain and bulging discs. And um, he felt the pain actually leave his body. Wow. Yeah. Praise the oh, Lord. Yeah. Well, this is Barbara. She lives in Springfield, Missouri. She'd suffered with acid reflux for a long time. It was painful and affected her eating. Nothing she did seemed to relieve the discomfort. She was watching this program, and Pat, she heard you say, acid reflux is completely healed in the name of Jesus. So she claimed it. Later that day, after she ate, she realized she had no digestive problems, and the pain was totally gone. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, we have a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. He loves you beyond anything you can imagine. Now, we have some very wonderful people here in the studio with us. They have needs. We want to pray for them. Uh, you're at home. You may be watching this program in India. You may be in China. You may be in Africa. You may be uh, in the heartland of America. You may be in some big city. Wherever you are, God knows who you are. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands. And we're going to believe God for you. Father, right now, I join with my sister in Christ, and we believe you for the answer. Oh, somebody has a hacking cough. You've had this thing for some months now, and you've just asked God, please do something. God is just reaching down and taking all the phlegm and all of the congestion out of your lungs, and they are completely healed in Jesus' name. Terry. Somebody else, you're plagued with osteoporosis, and uh, it's become life interrupting. You've had it for some time, but it's becoming a problem daily. God's knitting your bones together again in health and strength and wholeness. Just receive that today. Uh, Marcy, you, you've got a tick de la rue. Uh, it, it's in your face, and it's just jumping, and you, you haven't been able to do anything about it. Right now, at this moment of time, just touch it, and then from that moment on, you are completely healed. Terry. Someone else, you have strong pain in your hip. I don't know if you've had a replacement or not. It's in the joint of the hip, but it really hampers your ability to be mobile and to, to walk freely. God's, you're going to feel like a warmth come there right now as God just heals that for you. Somebody, I believe the name's George, you are so terrified. You are just having terror. You don't quite know what you're afraid of, but you are afraid of everything. And God is setting you free. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. You are free in the name of Jesus. The spirit of fear is leaving you now in Jesus' name. Yeah. Touch! Yeah. Terry. Yeah, someone else, you, there's, you've done some things in your life that nobody else knows about that have not been godly things, and you feel like God is not able you, to forgive you. Just receive his forgiveness today. Thank He's you. saying to you, be healed in Jesus' name. And may the peace of the Lord yes. Jesus Christ come into your life. May you know peace, peace of God in Jesus' yes. name. Amen. amen. And amen. Thank you. Let us know what God's done for you. If you need further prayer, we're here for you. Somebody's here. would love to pray for you. Pick up the phone. Uh, we're there, there, there uh, on the phones. Terry. Well, coming up, time to answer the email questions you sent in. Deborah says, I want to pray with my husband so we can strengthen our relationship. But he's resisting. Any advice? Stay tuned for another round of Bring It On when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The professor who eventually parted ways with Wheaton College over her views on Islam is joining the faculty at the University of Virginia. Larisha Hawkins will research relationships between religions and races at UVA. Hawkins was teaching political science at Wheaton when she claimed Christians and Muslims worship the same God. And she put on the headscarf worn by some Muslim women to counter what she called vitriolic rhetoric against Muslim. Wheaton announced last month that it and Hawkins had reached a confidential agreement for her to leave. 
Operation Blessing is helping families in Tennessee provide food for their children. Alicia is a single mother of five who was struggling to put food on the table until a friend referred her to an Operation Blessing run food pantry called Joseph's Storehouse. Alicia is now able to provide nutritious meals for her children. She is just one of 600 families Joseph's Storehouse provides food for. Alicia says she is thankful for the assistance and was recently able to land a better job to help provide for her children. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to its website, ob.org. Pat and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. Well, we have some exciting news to announce. We've been running a contest on this program. The grand prize, tickets to see the world premiere of the new film, Miracles from Heaven. Well, we're pleased today to announce the winner. It's Mrs. Jerry Howard from Washington, Vermont. Jerry and her husband, Stephen, are going to be flying out to Hollywood for the red carpet event. So we want to congratulate Jerry and her family. And we want to thank all of you who participated in the contest. And don't forget, Miracles from Heaven, starring Jennifer Garner and Queen Latifah, opens on March the 16th in theaters nationwide. So it looks like a great movie and one that's good for the family to see. It looks really nice. Yes, I'm, it I'm does. Congratulate the winner of our <laughs> contest. <laughs> that All should right. be fun. Well, time to bring it on. Okay, let's Some go of the for email it. that's mm -hmm. come in. Okay, Pat, this first one is from Deborah, who says, Pat, I want to pray with my husband. I try at night before he goes to sleep, and he'll say what she says. Amen. In the morning, he just says, Thank you for this day. And that's about all I can get out of him. I know he talks to the Lord every morning, but I just think our marriage and prayer life would be much stronger together. Any suggestions? Oh, my suggestion is take what you've got and thank the Lord for Amen, it. Amen, brother. But uh, I really think that's Amen. it. But, you know, what he needs to do is to see some men who are not ashamed to pray. And uh, there are men's groups, people who uh, they're good men. If you could find people like that in the church, or maybe he'd come over uh, for dinner or you know, a social gathering or something, and he could get to know people like that uh, who are not ashamed. You know, a lot of men are very private, and they, 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 their inner spiritual life, they don't want to expose to anybody, including their spouse. Yeah. It's just the way it is. Uh, so as I say, thank God for what you've got. What's next? Okay, this is Donna who says, I've been remarried and have adult children. My husband also has adult children. My parents died and left a large inheritance. My husband says that because he's the spiritual head of the house, that the money is his and demands that the money be put into our joint account. He has racked up credit card debt over $30,000 since getting married two years ago. My parents worked hard and saved all their lives, so I would have an inheritance. I want to use some money to help with my kids' college expenses, etc. And my husband's very angry. Do I just hand over the money to keep the peace or stand my ground, put it into a separate account to protect it? I'm afraid that this could lead to years of fighting and strife. Boy, I'm sorry for that. Uh... That money is yours. It was given you by your parents. It doesn't belong to him. Uh, you know, a lot of people have trusts that actually keep a spouse from getting the money uh, because they know that the spouse will waste the, the funds and they intended for their, their child and they want the child to have the money or their grandchildren. So uh, your parents gave specific instruction as you said, they worked hard. They saved the money. It's their money, and they gave it where they wanted. They did not give it to your husband. So you need to tell him, I'm sorry. That's is given to me. It's mine, and I'm putting it in a trust account for me and for my children. And I'm sorry, uh, it's not yours. Uh, they, He'll get over it. Huh? He'll get over well, it. Well, you hope he gets over it. If you have a, a fight about it, uh, that's one of those things. You married him. I didn't. <laughs> All right. Okay. This is a viewer who says, I'm 21 years old and I have had a speech impediment my entire life. I don't have any mental issues impacting my speech. My tongue just wasn't trained properly. I avoid saying words such as for and door. It's real tough. I've been praying that I can speak properly and I have faith that he can do anything. I'm just not finding any scripture of him healing anybody with speech impediments. Is there any scriptural references? Yeah. Does he heal speech impediments? It, where <clears throat> Moses said, I'm not eloquent. And God said to Moses, who made your mouth? Uh, 
Uh, he said, I can put words in your mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can be my spokesman. And Moses said, oh, I can't, I can't do it. And God said, you will do it. And okay, well, I'll put Aaron out there. He can be the spokesman. But <clears throat> one of the, the great uh, Greek uh, debaters, one of Demosthenes, uh, who put rocks in his mouth, and he used to shout against the sea with rocks in his mouth to overcome speech. Uh, Clark Gable, well-known movie actor, played in Gone with the Wind. He had a real high squeaky voice, and this lady took him under her wing, and he would sit with a piano and hit a note, a bass note, and force his voice to hit that it's note over that and over and over again. So you got a problem, work on it. It's, it's a muscle you can train like any other, all right? This is a viewer who says, what is your advice for a teenager, 15, trying to grow in Jesus Christ? I've been through a lot like internet pornography and sexual addiction. I want God's will to be done. Thank you for your advice. Well, you know, the Bible says, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? So you've got to so, uh, saturate yourself in the Word of God. You need to read the Word. You need to read uh, and memorize Scripture, especially the Psalms and Proverbs, over and over again. But how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy Word? Uh, thy Word is a lamp and a light, and you need to know the Word of God, and it needs to be part of you. Uh, it's just like breathing. You, you need to just, when something comes up, the Word will be there for you. Mm -hmm. And it's a st <coughs> stabilizing factor. And, uh, you know, that's how you do it. I don't know what else to tell you. You know, I second that. It was the Word that changed my life. It wasn't yeah. just praying the prayer of salvation. It was getting into the Word the and letting word. the Word get into me. It, well, it, it, you know, you, you, you eat the Word. Yep. The Word becomes part of you and you... you it actually is part of the fiber of your being. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for email questions, okay. but thank you, and thank you for your questions. We love hearing from you. Well, up next, a dropout who wanted to be a tough guy, but there was just one problem. I wanted to be that guy that, hey, you don't mess with Abraham or he's going to get you when in reality I was scared. He's not scared anymore, but he's also not trying to be tough anymore. You'll see what changed him, and that's next. Abraham Bellinger learned at a young age how to fight, steal, and deal. Abraham was on the fast track to prison until a stranger invited him somewhere else. I was at the top of our wooden steps, and I remember looking down those steps and seeing my dad with his hands around my mom's neck. My mom basically fighting for her life. Growing up, Abraham Bellinger lived in constant fear and chaos. His father was an abusive addict, and his mother suffered the consequences. They divorced when Abraham was six, forcing his mom to take on three jobs to provide for him and his sister. My mom was working all the time. My dad's not present. I was just so afraid. I was alone. Didn't feel like I had anybody I could turn to. At school, Abraham was bullied for being poor, which made him feel even more isolated and alone. I started developing anger issues felt like it was me against the world. I started stealing, starting fights, trying to be this big, mean, strong man. Really inside, I was, I was struggling. I was just this little boy that was fearful of not belonging, feeling temporary, and like that had no lasting purpose. He was in middle school when his mother remarried, but his stepfather was cold and verbally abusive. Under his roof, Abraham grew more desperate to find a place to fit in and to protect himself from anyone who tried to hurt him. It was then he found a gang. I started finding crowds that I could hang around where I felt protected. They had this big reputation of, you know, don't mess with this guy, or he's gonna get you. So I started trying to fit in with that crowd. I wanted to be that guy that, hey, you don't mess with Abraham or he's gonna get you when in reality I was scared. 
By 15, he had dropped out of school, was running with a gang, and dealing drugs. While it gave him a sense of security and belonging, another fear emerged. I had a great fear that I just would kind of float through and live and die, you know, and that's it. I felt like I was just there, but I wasn't. There was really no meaning in my life. When he was 18, Abraham was arrested on possession charges. Someone else took the rap, and he got off with just one year of probation. Afterwards, he attempted to get his life straight. As much as I wanted to change, I couldn't change myself. I had all of this fear, all this hurt, all this anger, all of this sense of wanting to belong and fit in. But everything I tried, nothing worked, nothing worked. So I figured, well, I'll, I'll try selling a little bit more drugs. One Saturday, Abraham was walking the streets looking to make a score. He had just passed by a church when an older woman approached him and invited him to the Sunday church service. Abraham was taken by her kindness and said yes, hoping he might make a new friend. The next day, when he went into the church, he experienced something he never had before. I'm walking in right at time of prayer. As many people as were in there, I felt alone, but I'm feeling a sense of lightness, like, oh, this is pretty nice. And I'm hearing this message, there is purpose, there is hope. And I'm like, he's speaking to me. It was the, the thing that I was hungering for and thirsting for all these years. I was like, oh my goodness, this, this is it. Like, I, I have to come back. That night, he returned for the evening service. God himself came to me right there and let me know I'm who you've been searching for. Uh, I'm the belonging you need. He showed me that he was there with me the whole time. He took my loneliness and he filled it with his love. He filled it with his grace. And I was like, all right, Lord, this is it. Like, I want you, I don't want anything else. At that moment, Abraham found where he belonged in the arms of his heavenly father. In the following years, he realized his purpose and became a preacher. He even founded a church which continues to grow. These days, he keeps pretty busy as a husband and father of five, and he credits God for all of it. Jesus Christ literally came into my life and spoke life into me. He stepped in and showed me like I was here the whole time. I have a purpose for you, I have a destiny for you. There was nothing anyone else could have done. Only God can do it. You know, in every one of our lives, there comes a time where all the noise of the world doesn't satisfy, and there's a great, deep emptiness inside of us that initiates a search for significance. Who am I? Why am I here? What in the world is this all about? And in the middle of a lot of that, we've gone through things like Abraham's gone through, things that cause you to stop dreaming, to stop trusting, to stop believing. And then God, in that tender moment of need in our lives, says, I'm here and I love you. Trust me. You know it's a choice. And sometimes it's a hard one if you've come through hard places. A search for significance with things of the world can come to an end. Easy come, easy go. You know, that's just the way it is in our lives. But with God, the one who created you and I and everything around us, it's forever. It's forever. He never lets go. He never stops loving. He's always forgiving. And he's saying to you, believe, trust, hang on to me. I'm what you've been looking for. Maybe that same yawning emptiness, that same need to find purpose and a place to belong is in your heart today. You can satisfy that right now, right this minute, by saying, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. I want to know you. I'm inviting you into the middle of my emptiness, and I'm asking you to reveal yourself to me. I know who I am. I know I fall short of the mark. I don't know why you love me. I don't know why you care but I need to know who you are and why I'm here. God's so faithful. You know, it's just a conversation. He's interested in a relationship with you. 
He's your dad, your father, the one who created you. The Bible says he knew you before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, and he had a purpose for you. So talk to him today. Just say, Jesus, I want you to be the savior of my soul, the forgiver of my sin, the Lord of my life. I want you to teach me your ways. I want to love you, and I want to receive your love. Will you reawaken my heart? Show me how to live for you. If you pray that prayer and you want to know how to go on and grow and find out all that there is to know about him, call us. Our number is toll free. It's right there on your screen, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I've prayed that prayer and I'd like the new day packet. Pat put this together just for you and we'd love to help you grow in your faith. This is just the beginning of a brand new life. So call now. Pat. Well, thanks, and thanks for being with us. We hope that you'll have a wonderful weekend and that day after day we'll get to be sweeter and better uh, in the service of the Lord. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Proverbs 9, verses 10 and 11. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, for by me your days will be multiplied and the years of life will be added to you. Well, for Terry and all of us, we'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye.